Hi, everybody. Today, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the International Baccalaureate or the IB. I'm Dr. Vincent Chen, and I'm the principal at Fairview International School, Kuala Lumpur. So what's the problem with education today? So there's two major problems. The first one is that it was designed in the industrial era. And as a result of that, the focus there was really getting as much information into people as fast as humanly possible. And then having them repeat that onto an exam paper. So really the focus was on putting knowledge into people's heads. That doesn't really work so much anymore today since we have Google. The second problem is that in that era, we also tried to figure out who's smarter than who or who's more valuable than who. And therefore we try to assess everybody on the same scale. So we made everybody sit an exam paper and then told them you're better than who or so and so forth. Well, that doesn't really take into account all the variety of human skills out there. It only tests one thing, how well you can memorize really. So what's the IB? Well, firstly, it started out in 1968. So it's been around for a little while. Secondly, it's not based in any one country. So it's not American, it's not English, it's not uh, Australian or Canadian or whatever it is. It's truly, truly international. So at least you know the history books, they don't leave anything out. Third, it's practiced very widely across the world. Over a million students have learned through the IV. More than 5,000 schools in more than 150 countries practice the IV. Fourth, it runs right across the age range. So it starts out in the youngest age groups with the primary years program or the PYP for short, for ages three up to 12. Then it goes through secondary school in the IB middle years program or IB MYP for short. And that's about 11 to 16. And then there are two potential pre-university courses next which uh, they are called the IB Diploma or the IB DP or the IB uh, Career Related Program or the IB CP. The Diploma Program gets you into universities for tertiary education, whereas the CP gets you into uh, vocational courses. Now, if you really want to understand the IB, I give you three things to remember it by. One, it's a system of best practices. Two, it's very internationally recognized. Three, it prepares learners for life, not another exam. What, is, what do they all mean? I'll take you through it slowly one by one. So the IB is a system of best practices. What does this really mean? Well, education's really progressed a lot over the last decade. And all the right ways of teaching and learning, things that every teacher should be using in their classroom, well, the IB put them the, together and said, teachers, you have to do this and we're going to check up on you. And if you don't do this, you can't be an IB teacher and you can't call this an IB class. And there's so many words from inquiry to concept-based teaching and learning to assessments. I'm not going to bore you with all of them. There's actually really a lot of words. I'm going to focus on just two things out of all of those words. One, inquiry-based teaching and learning. And secondly, international mindedness. So what's this pedagogy called inquiry-based teaching and learning? It's an amazing pedagogy where we really focus on having the kids observe and then generate ideas about things and then ask lots and lots and lots and lots of questions. It's not to be commonly confused with the interrogation technique that we see a lot in our classes. Interrogation sounds a little bit like this. You there, what's the answer to this? What's the answer to this question? What's the answer to this question? It brings about fear, trepidation, embarrassment, humiliation, and your child's probably gonna have a lot of scars for the rest of their life if they've been interrogated by a teacher. Inquiry, on the other hand, could look a little bit more like this. Kids, here's a picture of a ER room during the pandemic. What do you see? Oh, teacher, there's a lot of people in there and they're all really sick. Teacher, teacher, I don't see any doctors in the picture. 
Oh no, I see one doctor and a lot of people. Yeah, what do you think is going on, guys? Oh, you know, teacher, this could be going on, that could be going on. Okay, well, what do we need to understand about this situation? Oh, somebody just collapsed on the floor. Here's another picture of what happened in there. Somebody collapsed on the floor. What happened, guys? Oh, teacher, teacher, if he came from that same uh, ER room, then he could have had uh, a, a disease or something. Well, he's clutching his chest uh, and he's got a, 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 a mask over his face. What do you think could have happened? Oh, it could be something with his breathing, teacher. Now you see how we're drawing out questions there? It's not interrogating, it's what do you think could be happening? How could this be? What could be a possibility? And finally, we'll probably ask, kids, what do we need to know to really understand what's going on? What do we need to learn about? There we go. That's where the learning happens in inquiry-based teaching. So another amazing thing that they do in the IB is this thing called international mindedness. Now, in the IB, we define international mindedness as somebody who receives everybody else's ways of thinking, ways of living, ways of believing, their cultures, their belief structures, and we don't judge them. We teach our children to say, look, just because somebody else thinks differently from you, it doesn't mean they are wrong, and neither does it mean that you are wrong. It could mean that both of you are right in your own way. Teaching this helps our children discuss and collaborate instead of attack, debate, and argue. The power of this actually comes in the way that it's the international mindedness is woven into the fabric of every class. It's not just the poster on the wall. In every topic that a teacher teaches, they have to demonstrate to their coordinators, their principal, and the IB, how they involve the students in an activity, say about 15, 20 minutes or so, that teaches the children or gives them an opportunity to expand themselves on this regard. So let's say they're talking about um, the, the ER room and somebody's collapsed on the floor. And the, the man who collapsed on the floor doesn't want to be touched by a female nurse. We'll have an open discussion about that. Why do you think that's the case? Is it a bad thing? Can we respect his values at the same time? Can we help him in a different way? And we'll talk about it. There may not be a right answer. There may not be a wrong answer, but at least our kids will be well-practiced discussing and trying to receive and accept instead of judging all the time. Children who grow up to be international minded will be incredibly successful in the future because they know how to welcome and receive people of all cultures, faiths and beliefs. So the next most important thing that you need to know about is that the IB is super well recognized internationally and universities love the IB. IB students receive preferential treatment when they go to admit themselves into top universities around the world. And let's give you some examples. So we've got a couple here. Say for example, Harvard University. Their statement is the IB is known to us as an excellent preparation, not good preparation, um, nice preparation, excellent. Success at an IB program correlates well with success at Harvard. We are pleased to see the credential of the IB diploma on the transcript. Wow. And this is the assistant dean of admissions from Harvard saying this. LSE in the UK said the diploma students are well-rounded, multifaceted, multi-skilled, and have studied in depth. They have good time management skills. They score higher than students in other national systems. And the IB score is worldwide the same measure. Wow. Can you hear that? It's better than other national systems. Um, we have great quotations coming from Princeton and MIT, all saying the same thing, that the IB prepares students really well. Now, this specifically refers to the IB diploma, but what we need to recognize is, in order to really prepare yourself for the IB diploma, to get all these right ways of thinking and learning going through, so that you do really well there, you need to prepare yourself at the primary years program. 
If you come in late into the IB, you're going to have to unlearn all of these horrible bad habits like memorizing for exams um, and um, trying to figure out what are the questions that's going to come out and spot questions. Now, they did a study in the UK about all the pre-university programs and who's going where and doing what. And this was called the HESA study. The link is over there. But what they found out was that IB students compared to A-level students went into the top 20 universities at an increased rate. In the UK, IB students doing better than A-level students. What's going on? 45, 46% of IB students went to the top 20 universities, whereas 33% of A-level students did the same. IB students also got more first-class honors degrees, second-class honors degrees, and went on to do uh, postgraduate studies. Another part of the study, if you really want to read it as well, is that IB students earn more money when they graduate from university. So we've gone through the two major things to remember about the IB. Firstly, the IB is a system of best practices. And the second being the IB is super well recognized internationally. The third important thing to remember about the IB is that it prepares learners for success at life, not another exam. And we're gonna talk a little bit about assessments right now. So the big problem with assessments primarily, we know it, memorize, 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 and then vomit out the answer. Or even worse, uh, on the, this wonderful picture over here shows very well, kids, you better learn what I'm showing you during this um, revision class because it's all coming out in the exam. These kinds of assessments are meaningless. I mean, if you worked in the office, and you ask your boss, boss, what's gonna be coming out in my performance evaluation? Can you tell me the questions? I think you get fired the next day. And your boss is not gonna care how much you memorize. You're gonna care about how much you can do things, apply your knowledge in creative ways, working with other people. How well you do in an exam paper really, really doesn't cut it. To prepare our learners for success at life, we need to make sure that our assessments are relevant and meaningful and then we need to make sure our learners can choose the assessment they want to do as well so that they have a hand in how they're being assessed the choice you say is that that sounds crazy how's that supposed to work let me give you an example so let's say i'm teaching primary four kids states of matter you know where they learn about uh, things evaporating and things getting solid because you freeze it so i teach them all of this and I teach them over the water cycle as well. And then after that, I say, okay, kids, we're gonna have a choice. What do we wanna do? We can either do a presentation about the water cycle where we describe everything, or you can do a diorama, which is a, a, a you, you make something and then you explain it to me. So we give them a choice. Now it's not a complete choice where they can do anything they want to. That will be far too dangerous and we wouldn't be able to get very far. But when you give children the ability to choose how they want to be assessed, they really go into it real hard because they had a say in it. Now, would doing a presentation or a diorama, which is kind of like a, um, a clay uh, model, would these things demonstrate knowledge better than a worksheet? Absolutely. When you, a child can just talk through the water cycle and describe it using images, and get excited about it, they have really internalized information compared to if they just write down some memorized words on a worksheet. Now, of course, we still use worksheets in the IB. It's not that we don't use them, it's that we don't overuse them. In traditional education, worksheets are badly overused. But in the IB education, we use it appropriately and then we use other forms of assessment that can engage our students because they mean something and they make sense. It, it, it's very difficult to explain yourself fully by writing down things uh, as a primary four child or having to fill in the blanks. It just doesn't really encapsulate all that wonderful higher order thinking that can come out. 
You can't see how the child's emotionally involved with the subject. You can't see how excited he is. And they can't talk about it um, the way they would talk to other people. Because let's face it, in the future, when he's in the adult world, and maybe he needs to draw on the water cycle, he'll remember his assessment and what he said there, and he'll use it there. Can you see how relevant and meaningful this assessment has become? Another amazing thing the IV does is they use rubrics, not percentiles and not alphabet grades. Now, most people don't know what a rubric is, so I'm going to explain it to you nice and slow. So let's say you were doing a presentation about the states of matter um, and the water cycle. And that was the assessment, really, to describe the water cycle, so on and so forth. And I said, OK, thank you for your video presentation. Here's a 60%. You'll be going, well, what did I do wrong? Um, what did I do right? What 60% mean? Well, you didn't say these key words. Think about it really. Does that really mean very much? Like, does it mean that you're a better, you'll be a better understanding or less understanding just because you didn't say a few keywords? Does it really help you move forward? It doesn't. Oh, uh, you got to see because um, you didn't do what I told you to do in class. Um, it's very hard for a student to figure out how they're going to progress when you give them a percentile score or an alphabet grade. Say, try this for example. We use this criteria example right in front of you here. Criterion A, knowing and understanding. And let's say I give you the same presentation and you're supposed to describe the water cycle. And I gave you, let's just say a three or a four. I'll say, okay, what you did was you stated and each word in bold, by the way, over there has a specific definition. It's called command terms. And we teach them to our kids so they really understand what these words mean. You only stated the water cycle and the different states of matter. You didn't really outline it. But teacher, what is outline? Well, we taught you about outline. Outline is defined as giving a brief account or summary. You just said, okay, this is what it is. This is what it is. This is what it is. But you need to describe what is happening over there. Give a little bit of a description. That's how you get to a five or a six. And if you want to get to a seven or eight, you need to really describe it. Now, describe is properly defined as give a detailed account or a picture of a situation, event, pattern, or process. Describe the whole cycle together. Not just a little bit of a description, but a lot more of a description. Now, when you give a child this rubrics and you teach them about how to use the rubrics and say, this is how you succeed at your presentation, before the presentation, you give them the, the rubric, let them figure out how to get to that point, then they are equipped and empowered to succeed. Why do we uh, have our kids sit an exam and then, oh, surprise, here's the mark scheme. No, we don't prepare our kids to succeed enough. And that's what rubrics just really do. So every child just needs to read the rubric as they prepare themselves for their assessment and they can succeed. And they know exactly what needs to be done in order to succeed. That's the power of a rubric. So we've gone through three important things about the IB. One, that it's a system of best practices. Two, that it's internationally recognized. And three, that it prepares you for life, not for another exam. But there are some myths I really wanna bust straight off the bat. One, the IB is really difficult um, and typically this comes from people in traditional education that are coming into the IB because they've got some really bad habits to sort out. And that includes things like looking to find answers for the exam, what's the right answer, spotting questions and exam papers, looking for, oh, teacher, which pages of the textbook do I read? If you can't sort out these bad habits, you're going to really suffer in real life. And the IB tries to help you get out of that immediately so that you don't end up getting reprimanded by your boss. The second one, the IB is not for common people because it's so expensive. Well, it's kind of true that the most expensive school in Malaysia is, I think it's about 10,000 ringgit a month. Um, but Fairview is 2,000 ringgit a month on average. And that's because we're committed to providing accessible quality education for everybody, not just for the rich and wealthy. Third, the IB is not recognized by universities worldwide. Well, I've kind of shown you how it is, and how the universities really love it. And finally, the IB assessment is different and vague. 
So I've really shown you about how we use rubrics and how we make me assessment meaningful uh, and relevant. So like all good IB lessons, we need to recap. So what is the IB? One, it's a system of the best practices in teaching and learning out there, all put into one beautiful place for you. It's internationally recognized right across the world. And it prepares learners for life, not another exam. Thank you so much for watching my video. And please do get in touch with us if you ever want to find out more about the IB and Fairview.